Welcome to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters, and welcome to our new home on AM 970, The Answer. Our very special guest is newly elected council member, speaker of the council, Melissa Mark Viverito. She is our first guest on our new radio station, our new home. Welcome to Reaching Out, and thank you for graciously accepting to come on Reaching Out as our first guest on 970 AM. Wow, what a, it's a true honor and a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. You're very welcome. First, I'd like to congratulate you on your election by your colleagues in the city council. As a new speaker, you have been a part of the labor movement, a strong supporter for union members and advocate for public employees, and also a great friend of people who live in public housing. What are your first issues that you are already working on just a month into your uh, post-Bloomberg administration? We know there was one with the um, the Family uh, the Sick Leave sick, Act, the Paid, paid sick, sick Leave yes. Act, yes. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and, and thank you for your leadership, Greg, mm -hmm. in, in, in the Teamsters and representing hardworking families across the city. Uh, that is reason one of the reasons that I wanted to get into public service and now as Speaker of the City Council, very excited that we can really move forward an agenda that is inclusive and that is very much embracing uh, those that have struggled to, to be here in New York City and to continue to provide for their families. And so our agenda is, is really to kind of amplify that progressive vision that really has been uh, pretty much uh, mandated in the last election cycle when we've seen this great wave of change in positions of leadership with the mayor. Um, so we are really going to roll up our sleeves and get to work on some issues that really matter. Obviously, uh, one of the first acts that we've done is, is introduce legislation to expand the paid sick leave legislation uh, that had been adopted in the last session, supposed to go into effect April 1st. Some of us felt that we wanted to cover more workers, and so we are introducing a bill to, to augment and uh, have represent more workers who would receive paid sick, day, uh, sick days on an accrual basis. Obviously, we are looking at issues of the universal pre-K plan that the mayor has laid out and really advocating for Al uh, Albany to allow New York City as a municipality to tax itself and those that live here to that modest tax increase that will provide for universal pre-K for every child. Uh, as you indicated, I've been a really strong advocate for our public housing stock in the city of New York and figuring out ways that we can have the authority be more responsive and responsible to those that live in public housing, our residents. Uh, we want to improve the quality of life and make sure that we continue to invest in the public housing stock in the city. So it's an agenda of change, of progress, of having everybody come to the table and basically try to get to work and, and do um, in, enact laws public policies that are going to help uplift every New Yorker. Now, going back to the paid sick leave, uh, just tell us briefly, what did the old bill do and what did the new bill contain that the old bill didn't? So basically, the you know, the, the, there there was a conversation and, and debate that was going on for many years around paid sick leave. Uh, it was a law that, that um, or legislation that really did not move as quickly as some of us would have liked. It took a long time. By the time we finally did vote on it, it was a bill that uh, we felt needed to cover more workers. Right now, the bill that we passed in the last session is for businesses that have 20 or more employees would get uh, paid sick leaves on an accrual basis based on the number of hours you work. And there were those of us who wanted it to cover a larger number of workers. So now the bill that we're introduced has been introduced and that we will have hearings on basically is for any business that have, has five or more employees. So we're that with that, um, with I increasing that, we basically are going to be covering close to, you know, 500,000 additional workers that, you know, if they get sick, if their child gets sick, if their relative gets sick, their mother or a parent, that they're able to be able to take that time off without fear of retribution or retaliation from the the employer. So it's very significant. A lot of other municipalities have implemented such legislation, and it has not had an adverse impact on the small business community or the business community. And I think that this is really something that we want to send a message, that workers are to be respected. People should be able to work 
and provide for their families without fear of retaliation. Uh, that This is a right that I have as a council member, that you have as someone sure. that works in a union, that most that have a representation of unions and that work in the private sector have that right. So why shouldn't low-wage workers that work in a service industry have the same right? So we're, you know, we're very excited about being able to push this forward and, and helping more wor- uh, workers in the city of New York. Now, the uh, pre-K tax that everyone's mm-hmm. talking about that you, you mentioned a little bit uh, uh, earlier, uh, tell us what that would entail and tell us uh, about the pre-K plan. New York City. So the plan as presented, again, that this is what people have to understand and, and people do. Those that are listening most probably went to the to the polls and they voted, right? But the overwhelming mandate for Mayor de Blasio when he was a candidate, the real center of his platform was the issue of universal pre-K, was the issue of taxing those that make more than five hundred thousand dollars a year. A modest, modest, very modest um, increase. I think it would be for someone earning five hundred thousand dollars or more on average, an additional nine hundred dollars a year that they would have to pay in taxes. That amount would be specifically and solely invested in ensuring that every child has pre-K, and that's critically important because if we want our children to succeed, if we want to help the economy of New York City, then creating a foundation which allows that child to do well in school, to graduate to then hopefully go on to college. You know, that that early education is critical. And in the city of New York, um, you know, the district like the one that I represent, which is a low-income district of color, uh, there's a big achievement gap between black and brown kids yes. and their white counterparts. And one of the issues and concerns is that, it, when it, not concerns, what's been proven is that when you provide for an early education, you help start closing that achievement gap. And so that's why it's really important for communities like the one I represent, communities across the city of New York, that we really do level the playing field. And uh, this is really something I feel strongly about. And what we need to do in order to do this is that we have Albany needs to allow us, New York City, to tax our own New York City residents. And that is something that we've taken that message to Albany. I was in Albany last week with 20 of my colleagues. The mayor went to Albany um, you know, to send the message that New York City, as a municipality, has the right, as any other municipality in the state of New York, to decide how to do how you know do their, their local taxation issues. So, you know, right now the governor has expressed a hesitancy of allowing us to do this and we're going to continue to send the message that this is what we need and this is what we want and that the election cycle that we just passed through um, sent that strong message and is giving us the uh, is empowering us as legislators to send that message to Albany. Uh, the New York City Housing Authority is a very important uh, integral part of my union uh, and it's also a part of your agenda also. I know you have a great love for the people in mm-hmm. NYCHA. Uh, what, where do you see um, NYCHA as opposed to uh, city politics these days? Uh, what do you think is going to happen with NYCHA? You know, this is a, a, real, it's a real hard one. Um, we've seen, and you, as you well know, Greg, you know, we've seen such a level of disinvestment in our public housing uh, in this city of New York by the federal government. I think we still, for every dollar that we need for infrastructure and for maintenance of our public housing stock, we get maybe 85 cents to every dollar that we need. So there's a shortfall yes. every year, which obviously, as every year you know, it adds on, that, that becomes more of a, a structural deficit of sorts that really uh, leads to us not investing in much in the capital repairs that we need in, in the aging housing stock. So there's been an incredible disinvestment at the federal level. There's also been a disinvestment at the state and city levels. You know, our budgets don't really have money for, for NYCHA set aside. It used to at one point. Yes. The state used to allocate some money to our public housing uh, stock and authority. It doesn't do that anymore. Neither does the city, really. Those of us in the, in the council that have public housing, we do provide some capital monies for right. it, but obviously it doesn't meet the need. Sure. I mean, I've got 20,000 units of housing, uh, public housing in my district, and so I don't have enough money in, in the amount that I can allocate to really help the way that, that it needs. So we have to figure out how do we turn that around, and it's not an easy answer. Obviously, we can always talk about having the authority um, be better run and managed, 
How can we find efficiencies and redirect that money towards our public housing? So we plan under uh, you know my leadership in the council to really be aggressive and really now with a new administration that also has a, co- a commitment to our public housing residents and to the public housing stock in the city, that we really roll up our sleeves and find some creative solutions um, that can help. Uh, One of the ideas that the old administration floated, which I was not in agreement with, was the infill plan, which uh, thankfully has been scrapped and is not being uh, moved on. But there has to be a way of re-envisioning the way that we can um, help sustain NYCHA. And I don't have all the answers right now. This is obviously a conversation that you sure. as Teamsters have yes. to be at the table. The administration has to be at the table. We as the council have to be at the table. Residents should be at the table and try to figure out what we can do. But we cannot continue and we cannot allow the, the level of disinvestment to continue because that really is going to lead to a state of disrepair in our public housing stock, which we can't afford. Uh, with the crisis we have in affordability in the city of New York, it's getting much harder to live here, more expensive to live here. You know, I've always said that public housing is the cornerstone of affordable housing in this city, and we need to do everything we can to continue to make sure that it survives. Right. Thank you. We look forward to a bright future. Uh, I'm Gregory Floyd, President Local 237 Teamsters. We're on our new station, 970 AM, The Answer, and a very special guest was Melissa Mark Viverito, the speaker of the New York City City Council. Thank you once again for coming on the show. Thank you.